Now, for your uh, title super, would you prefer Dan or Daniel? Dan is fine. Okay, perfect. Alrighty. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me. I appreciate it. I know it's a Thanks Saturday. for your time. Um, let's get into it. You are running for 3rd District Congress, correct? I am. Okay. Now, talk to me a little bit about why you're choosing to run. Well, there's um, basically uh, four reasons. Number one, I ran in 2016 uh, for the United States Congress, and I actually ran against Jeff Fortenberry. Then I ran in 2020 for the United States Senate, and now running in 2022 as well. I've got a lot of experience um, with the American Medical Association in Washington, D.C., lobbying for them, and so this has been in my blood. As a physician, there are two things that I think physicians need to do. Number one is treat patients, and number two, um, advocate for treating patients. So I've been advocating for people all over Nebraska for a long time, and politics is just an extension of that advocation for uh, Nebraskans all over the state. Yeah, absolutely. I forgot to tell you, you don't even have to look at the camera. You can just look right at me. Sure. Sorry, I meant to tell you no that. Problem. That was on me. Um, okay, now your direct um, opponent would be Adrian Smith, who has won every year since 2006, and he obviously is with the Republican Party. What leads you to believe that this is the year for change? Well, in the 3rd Congressional District, we've got an R plus 38 with a 78% Republican uh, type of uh, uh, 3rd Congressional District. So, certainly it is extremely difficult for any type of a Democrat to win in the 3rd Congressional District. But as a centrist Democrat, in order to get Republicans and independents to vote for me, I have to be 100% centrist. I have to be a Joe Manchin, Christian cinema type, uh, but common sense Democrat. And if you've got a strong message and you can get that message out, voters deserve the right to have two opponents who are very strong, who they can actually make a decision on rather than just one guy who's gonna get in over and over and over again. If nobody runs, voters have no choice. Therefore, right now we need to have a strong candidate in the third congressional district that can make a showing. Clearly, in order to do that, once I win the primary, it's gonna take about two to four million dollars in order to win this race. I understand that. I've done this twice before and I'm prepared to do the hard work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, talk to me about um, some of the experience that you have um, just if you're elected, what you'll bring as far as experience to Congress? Well, as far as experience to Congress, I've got uh, 23 points to my platform. As we know, all congressmen can do nothing more than uh, create bills, put those bills in, and allow those bills to be voted on. I think one of the key factors in any bill is to have a one-item bill. That bill should be on one piece of paper only. It should be a summary, and there shouldn't be any pork added to that bill at all. So, for example, bills that actually need to have common sense solutions. Number one, immigration. We need to have DACA with a two-year path to citizenship. Number two, we need to have immigration for non-citizen immigrants that have a job and are contributing members of society for a two-year path to citizenship. We need to have a health care reform and as a physician I have a plan for health care reform where it's a universal Medicare plan with an 80-20 with a defined cost defined benefit plan that every single American can afford the same way that we have Medicare right now. So those are just a few and hopefully we can get into a lot more but if you do want to go to my 23-point platform, you can go to wetcongress.com and you can see a lot of common sense solutions. Sure. Yeah, and you've touched on a couple different issues, but just another, I mean, I guess as we're heading into that May 10th election, and voters are probably curious, and I know I'm curious, what are some of the biggest issues that you see facing both the country as well as the state of Nebraska as you would be a representative of the state? Number one is the Ukraine is on every person's mind. With the Ukraine as a centrist Nebraskan, I'm in 100% favor of the MiG-29 airplanes going to Ukraine. With surface-to-air missiles, to anti-tank missiles, to anti-ship missiles, to any type of a cyber intelligence that we can give Ukraine. And if we can't get Ukraine into the 
uh, NATO, we can at least get them into the European Union, which is going to be a great help for Ukraine. Second, let's talk about the United States Supreme Court, because Judge Jackson just got onto the Supreme Court. And one of the bigger issues is, should we expand the Supreme Court? And the answer is yes. We should expand it to 10 Supreme Court justices. Number two, they should serve for 10 years only, and then they should be out. Number three, they should rotate one every year so that every single year you get a new justice, you get new blood, you get new thinking on that Supreme Court. And at number four, half of them should be liberal, half of them should be conservative, so that we have a completely balanced court. So it doesn't matter who the president is if that justice needs to be conservative and we've got a liberal president. That means that the Supreme Court has to balance with that type of a person. I think that's a much better way of doing it than having a bunch of um, old farts, really, uh, who are on the Supreme Court forever who do not reflect society as it is right now. Uh, certainly with health care, we need to have a health care reform. As a physician, I know that most people cannot afford their health care. If you can't afford your health care, your premiums are skyrocketing your deductible is skyrocketing. And if you try to get anything covered, you've got everything that's paid for, but nothing that's covered. It's a plan that does not work. With the Affordable Care Act, it's not the same right now as it was five years ago. It has expanded and inflated as well. So therefore, anybody that is a uh, sole proprietor that runs a small business cannot afford health care. And that's getting more and more all the time. And lastly, Social Security, as we know it right now, is going to be bankrupt by 2035. Right now, by 2035, 79% of Social Security is all that's going to be funded. How about if we take that $2.4 million per hour that you're paying as a taxpayer and $1.4 million per hour for non-military aid that we are giving overseas to uh, other countries and take all of that foreign aid and bring it back and support Social Security and fund Social Security first in this country. Because if we do not, we are going to be in huge trouble by 2035. Very interesting points there. Um, now, if elected, how do you plan to combat all of these different issues, both statewide and nationwide? Well, as a physician, I'm here to solve problems. That's what I do. And not only am I here to just solve problems, but I actually have to produce results as well. Otherwise, patients are not happy. You have to advocate for people. In the same way, you have to come up with a common sense solution. You have to come up with something that's good for all the people and good for the country. You have to come up with something that's good for both Republicans and Democrats. And last but not least, don't be afraid to give the other guy credit for a good idea. Because 100 years from now, after I die, nobody's going to remember who I am. Therefore, let's do good for the best of the country, not for the individual. Yes, very great points there. Um, now, talk to me a little bit about your leadership style and how you plan to lead, again, both the state and the country if you're elected. Well, the leadership style, number one, I listen to patients all day long every day. And if they disagree with me, they tell me. As a physician, I'm always learning constantly all the time. And if I'm wrong, that's not flip-flopping. That means you learn from experience, and it, then you go on to something that's even bigger and better. So when you get reasonable people in a room with a reasonable solution, you have to step out of there with some sort of a solution, and it cannot be partisan. It has to be for the good of the country. So you shake hands, you sit down, you see what somebody else's values are, you hopefully let them look at your values as well, and come up with some sort of a reasonable solution, because right now with partisan politics, we're spinning our wheels and going nowhere, and the American people are very frustrated with both parties. Yes, very true and very understandable, and we're seeing that as we head into these elections. Now, you touched on um, specifically the Russia-Ukraine topic, but what are some more of your thoughts on how that situation is being handled and what you would do differently if elected? Well, number one, I think that we've got to go into Ukraine full bore 
NATO has to go into Ukraine full bore, and we have to end this thing as quickly as possible. If we don't, it's going to go on for a long time, and then China is also going to invade Taiwan. We cannot look weak. We have to look strong. I'm a centrist Democrat. So as a centrist Democrat, I'm going to look at things just a little bit different than the people that are in the White House right now. I'm not going to criticize them. What I'm going to say is I would have done it different and been a lot more aggressive going into Ukraine. Okay, now we're going to touch on a couple other um, national topics, um, but talk to me a little about your viewpoint um, of abortion and specifically the Roe versus Wade. Well, with Roe versus Wade, most of my Republican patients and my constituency is feeling that Roe versus Wade, if it's overturned, means that abortion is outlawed. That's not true. What is really true is that if we overturn Roe versus Wade and you have a far liberal Congress and a far liberal Senate and a far liberal presidency, you may have a national abortion law that has as one of its options partial birth abortion. I don't think Nebraskans want partial birth abortion. What we really need with Roe versus Wade is to keep Roe versus Wade and we need to keep the 10th Amendment of States' Rights of Autonomy that says that if Nebraska wants right now 20 weeks, which is five months, if they want to go down to 15 weeks, or if Texas wants to go to six weeks, or if New York wants to go to 30 weeks, States' Rights of Autonomy is much more important right now than reversing Roe versus Wade in order to make sure that every single state has their right to set their own laws. Yeah, now, and talk to me a little bit. You mentioned um, partial birth abortion. For those that don't know, could you just clarify what that means? I'm a physician. When I was in medical school, I witnessed 22 abortions at 12 weeks. I know what an abortion is. There's no doubt about it. And that was at 12 weeks, three months. Partial birth abortion basically means as the baby is coming out of the vaginal canal, there is still the right to terminate that life. That's as simple as it can be. Now, many people are gonna have different views on abortion and rights of abortion as well. I get it. Kitty and I have five kids. Kitty and I have five grandkids. My pro-choice is pro-life. But at the same time, you cannot legislate morals to a society. What you have to do is let society dictate what they're going to tolerate state by state. And that's different in every state. Nebraska is not the same as New York, is not the same as Vermont, is not the same as California. Nebraska has to have their own state's rights of autonomy, which is Amendment 10. Yes. Now talk to me. Um, this is one of the last final national question I, I'll ask you. And I apologize. I keep looking down. I wrote down a couple questions for all my different races I'm covering before I, so I don't forget. Um, now talk to me a little bit about the year-round sale of E15 ethanol uh, fuel, which obviously President Biden just signed off on this past week. We have to have complete independence in all of our energy. With E15, here's what's going to happen. Number one, there's going to be an increased demand by farmers and corn prices are going to go up. Number two, the byproduct of E15 fuel happens to feed cattle and is much more nutritious for cattle than some corn products are. Number three, it's going to decrease emissions in the atmosphere because it's a hydrocarbon emission but does not have the same hydrocarbons when you burn ethanol as when you base oil-based products. And number four, it's going to give us the ability to be energy independent. Because if we are not energy independent and we get invaded, we are going to have to go through a national security issue. So it's going to be very vital to not only have E15, but also to have wind, to have solar, to have clean burning coal, to have nuclear, to have everything that we possibly can. And people are going to say, well, here's the deal. Uh, the E15 is not profitable. Wind is not profitable. Solar is not profitable. Not right now, but technology will make it profitable if we invest in it.
Okay. Now, and just please correct me if I'm wrong. What I'm understanding is you agree with President's decision or President Biden's decision to approve that year-round sale, correct? My platform in 2016 was a 30% ethanol, not a 15% ethanol. So I think we're getting there. Yes. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to clarify that. That is all the national questions I have for you. I have one other important question for you. As we get closer and closer to that May 10th election day, which is in just under a month, if you had a message to say to the voters and to the state of Nebraska, what would that be? Messages in the 3rd Congressional District, especially in the primary, because the primary right now involves Democrats and it involves independents. Democrats and independents need to have a candidate that is, number one, articulate, number two, that has impeccable credentials, number three, that has a strong platform and a strong message, and then in the general election, I have to also get Republicans to agree with me, which means I have to look at the whole state of Nebraska, especially the 3rd Congressional District, and I have to represent everybody, not partisan. So I have to be very centrist in what I'm talking about, but I've listened to people for now over 10 years, and I think that I've got a very strong platform, a very strong message that can go to Washington, D.C., that people can say, this is a guy who's thought about it, this is a guy who's got something that I agree with, and I would like to vote because I would like to see some of that platform actually go into fruition. Okay, and those are all the questions I have for you. Is there anything else you would like to add in regards to your campaign as it slowly approaches? Right now, the May 10th primary is imminent. If you don't go and vote, you have no say. All you can do is vote for a candidate that you agree with that is going to then implement those thoughts that you agree with. That's the way we do things. So therefore, if you have a candidate who is honest, who is transparent, with a strong message, it's extremely vitally important that every single voter become educated. Go to WickCongress.com. Please be educated. You're not going to agree with everything that I've got in there. That's fine. But if you agree with 80 to 90 percent, then I think that you've got a strong vote and an educated vote. But if you don't go out on May 10th, then you have no voice at all. Absolutely. Anything else you'd like to add today? Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure and it's really fun to campaign and to talk to people.